Good morning. Good morning. Good morning again. <laughs> Welcome. I invite you to come and grab a seat, and we'll start our uh, our second our second session this morning, our second plenary session this morning. No folks are coming and going, and, and uh, some, some folks who are here may not have been here in the morning. So w welcome. My name is Ed Bogish. I'm executive director of Syracuse COE. We're New York State's Center of Excellence in Environmental and Energy Systems. And if you weren't here this morning, please, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, our 17th annual symposium. Um, we design these events to bring together a diverse community of faculty and students and industry collaborators and our hope for your time here is that you will meet someone new and you'll have an intellectual collision and there'll be new new ideas and new partnerships will uh, will emerge from from this event um, we'll uh, we look forward to a keynote speech now and then we'll break for lunch you'll be able to go out and get lunch we encourage you to come back back into this room uh, inter interact with others, and then around 12:30 we'll have another another keynote talk, and also um, s several students will give uh, light lightning talks on uh, on their research. To uh, to introduce our um, our first keynote speaker in this uh, session, I'm pleased to introduce Bess Kriedemeyer. I want to say a few words about Bess. Um, this morning, uh, I'll repeat some words I said this morning. Um, you know, Syracuse COE originated in 2001 with uh, an award uh, to a team led by Syracuse University for something called a Star Center um, in Environmental Quality Systems, and then a year later we were designated under the state's Center of Excellence program. Um, we've worked with man many other universities in partnership with Syracuse University, SUNY ESF, SUNY Upstate Medical University, and universities across across the state over over the years. And actually, in the very beginning, we had a a, a um, we started with a, a great partnership that's that's continued to today with uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And there was a faculty member at RPI who's actually been been a, a speaker at our symposium several times, named Anna Dyson. And Anna Dyson had uh, vi visions of uh, of new building technologies that influenced our design of the headquarters. Actually, you may be familiar. There's a um, there's a portion of our south facade where there's an opportunity to plug new technologies in and evaluate their performance. And there is an installation in our south facade that actually originated from Anna and, and her team at RPI. Uh, and actually, it came out of a, a group that Anna, Anna is involved with that is based in New York City. So I love to say these are RPI students and faculty based in New York City testing their technologies in Syracuse. And it's a great example of collaboration across the state and our, our vision for the Syracuse COE. One of the PhD students on, on uh, Anna Dyson's team uh, joined her at the day that we opened the building in 2010. And her name was Bess Kriedemeyer. And uh, actually, Bess, I think, drew some of the posters that were uh, hanging, hanging on the wall at the time. And when Bess graduated with a PhD from RPI, uh, she was hired at the Syracuse University School of Architecture. And really, this was one, one of the first of a new generation of hires in the School of Architecture here at Syracuse uh, of individuals who have expertise relating to the to building systems and building technologies. Uh, others who have been hired sub subsequently include Amber Bartosh, uh, Daquan Park, Daquan Park, uh, Tarek Raka, and this is uh, a, a new generation of young faculty members in the School of Architecture at Syracuse that, that have uh, positioned the school for success in, uh, in future years, and it's really great, great to have them, have them all here. So without further ado, I'm pleased to invite Bess to come forward and uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Bess Kriedemeyer. Thank you, Ed. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next keynote, Brewster McCracken, who is coming to us from Austin, Texas, where he's the CEO of Pecan Street, Inc., which is the Applied Research Institute founded by the University of Texas. Pecan Street provides data-intensive research support for university industry applied research, 
by carrying out behavioral and technology interventions, and by operating Dataport, the world's largest research database on customer energy and water, water use. Most of Dataport's water data comes from measurement instruments that become street designs, manufacturers, and installs. Smart Grid today named Brewster one of the nation's 50 smart grid pioneers, and greenbiz.com named him to its Verge 25 list of 25 US smart grid leaders. Uh, the talk today is called Bring on the Data, its greatest resource and environmental challenges. So please welcome Brewster McCracken. Before I was at Beacon Street, I actually uh, served for two terms on the Austin City Council and elected citywide. And so I got, one time there was a, 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 a contentious landfill contract coming up. And land, land, the landfill business is kind of like one of the last bastions of kind of like the mafia, right? And uh, it's, a, it's a very bare knuckled kind of a business. And so one t uh, there was this landfill those can be built there's it was next to the airport and it was construction waste and so and another landfill operator who did not want this new landfill operate opening there would be uh um there would be competition he was in my office and he said you know um uh, this this uh this petrusable waste and so construction debris uh he said uh what's going on here is that uh austin energy wants to take the construction uh, debris from this landfill and use it as a free source of fuel for its power plants and there's a big conspiracy uh you know this uh, between austin energy and uh in uh, the solid waste services and i was like man you know that that could be true but uh if it's true it would be the first time in the 150 year history of the city of austin <clears throat> that two departments have coordinated on anything <laughs> And, and that, that's one of the, kind of the fundamental challenges as we look at cities uh, is, is that there are things that from an outsider's perspective should coordinate, but that the reality of how humans behave and how organizations work, that, that you know, the airport has its own budget that its own revenue, the electric utility has its own budget and its own revenue source, and you, the, the solid waste does too. And these are, they don't intermingle, and so there, there's not that, getting that kind of coordination is difficult. But let's, let's start off, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about Pecan Street and then we'll get into a, a history of kind of one of the most important cities in the history of the world from an urban planning uh, perspective, it is Chicago. So uh, first about Pecan Street, we're, you know, nonprofit is, uh, as best told you, uh, and we do baseline customer research, we test out new technologies and behaviors, uh, behavioral interventions, and, uh, and then see how new technologies work in the real world. So uh, we have about 800 homes around North America. Most are in Texas, but we have a cluster of them in this Mueller neighborhood, which is a new urbanist uh, community built at the side of the old airport in Austin. And uh, so it's been, a, this neighborhood's been around a little over 10, or right around 10 years now. And uh, notable is that it's, uh, we have about 250-ish homes in this neighborhood uh, within about a one-third square mile area. So we have a very concentrated area of kind of ongoing ability to test out uh, everything. We're, and we're measuring like crazy what goes on here. Every minute, uh, 12 to 24 circuits per home, uh, real and apparent power, and then voltage at the whole home uh, level. And uh, from a data management perspective, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're managing about the third most electric data in the state of Texas every day, uh, but we're doing it at 800 homes. So uh, that kind of gives you an, uh, a, a, an understanding of, of some scale of, how, of what we're doing on a household level. And so it's free for universities around the world. And uh, you know, a lot of folks at Syracuse University using Dataport uh, to over 250 universities in 62 nations are using data port now. So let's talk about the operating model for cities. So this, uh, we're going to start with Chicago, the fastest city in the history of the world, uh, at least until the 1980s or so, uh, that to go from zero to a million people. 
And uh, when you go from zero to a million people very, very fast, as Chicago did, it created all sorts of hairy problems that were kind of novel uh, for cities. But the other cities were starting to confront. And it was mainly like, how do you deal with managing water and wastewater and public health and things like that? And so Chicago had a different unique problem, this is a bit different from just about anywhere in the place, face of the earth, and that it is a totally flat city next to a lake. Now, that, think, think about that for a second from a wastewater perspective, because slope is very helpful for wastewater systems, because things flow downhill. And if, uh, but Chicago's flat because during the big ice age or the Pleistocene era, uh, basically there's a, a glacier a mile high over modern day Chicago, and it flattened out the soil, and then what uh, it, it, uh, Lake Michigan, what, what is Lake Michigan, was carved out of that. But as a result, Chicago is very unique in being a coastal city with no slope. So they, uh, here you had uh, already in the 1850s, uh, you know, very substantial population, no slope. Uh, their their, their uh, waste disposal operations were managed by roaming bands of pigs. <laughs> Just... And apparently, even the pigs were kind of getting overwhelmed by the job. So they, so they hired a guy, uh, Ch Ellis Chesbro, and they said, "Okay, we're going to figure out. Um, we're going to start my timer. Sorry, so, so I don't get so enchanted with the sound of my own voice that you're like, okay. Anyway, um, so uh, he he had uh, grown up in a railroad family, and and because they were like, okay, we've got this existing city, and we need to have wastewater lines now." The other problem is they were trying to do wastewater lines into Lake Michigan. <laughs> that, that created another problem they solved about 40 years later. But, uh, but the first thing is they had to get it out, out, of, out of the dirt. And uh, so uh, he had grown up a railroad family, and he knew that jack screws were used to lift up a train locomotive and take it maybe from one track to another track. So he's like, man, I wonder if we could do jack screws around entire buildings. And that's what they did. Uh, they would get thousands of jack screws. They'd get men around buildings, like uh, in this case, this hotel. They're, the people were still staying in the hotel, and they uh, and they raised the they raised the entire city up, building by building and block by block, uh, by ten feet. They would raise the building up an individual in jack screws. And then guys would race under there, dig holes, put new pilings. Do, then put in the wastewater lines, and then uh, and then do fill from Lake Michigan mud, and that's how they raise Chicago up to give it a slope. And uh, and, and as a result, uh, Chicago developed the first uh, U.S. centralized wastewater system, and they and they did it by raising the entire city up, and that became a template for how modern city infrastructure was built out. Uh, later, by the way, Chicago. Uh, became such a dreadful place to live even after this that uh, the World's Fair of 1893 uh, that they, uh, they, they recognized that cleanliness uh, was crucial to uh, a, a healthy uh, and, and satisfying urban environment. So the City Beautiful movement got started in Chicago uh, as well. Uh, if you ever seen the movie Gangs of New York, you realize you know just how terrible big cities were at the time, and and trying to make cities clean and healthy and uh, nice to live in was a was a na another major Chicago contribution to uh, how cities are built. But on on this, they by creating the first centralized U.S. wastewater system, they actually developed a template for city infrastructure in general, and it was uh, it was centralized ownership and delivery. Delivery, you know, electric lines. It was uh, wet water and wastewater lines. Uh, these are ex road systems, public transit, right? It was the, and it was expensive, extensive infrastructure that the market was really not well positioned to, to develop on its own. Uh, these are the kind of things that, to a degree, were a natural monopoly, and they're a natural monopoly in large part because the infrastructure was so expensive that there was really no. Uh, cost benefit to having competing sets of wastewater lines operated by private carriers. Uh, you know, in other words, you're not going to get a competitor once you get in there, but it became a good public provision. But there were other industries that had this natural monopoly model uh, that uh, were in the private side. So, uh, but in the city side is water and wastewater, electricity, gas, 
roads, and, and transit. So these are kind of the big centralized delivery models. And but we look at some other centralized industries uh, that came along. So uh, landline telephone, cable TV, newspapers. The fascinating thing about this is we, we think of these natural monopolies, but these are three industries right here that are either in total free fall or under serious assault. Uh, but they're not from a competing centralized model, but from a distribu distributed model, right? And distributed models already eaten alive newspapers uh, and the landline telephone uh, business through mobile. And then uh, cable TV is, is seeing the cord cutting emerge as well now. And so it, what it reveals is that there, are, that there is a model that is not a direct copy of the existing delivery model, but is a distributed model that uh, actually has proven very potent uh, for having a replacement uh, system. And this gets to the com, uh, concept that uh, the Percy C. quoted at the beginning. In my first slide, Stephen Johnson, great, all of his books are great, but, uh, but, but he writes about this idea of the adjacent possible that a technology will improve and it will suddenly, in, a, in an adjacent industry, make something possible that was not before possible. And Steve Jobs talked about this at the time that uh, Apple went ahead with the uh, iPod, which is uh, that he said until Wi-Fi started showing up in homes, that there really wasn't any reason uh, uh, for uh, the iPod, but once but once Wi-Fi started showing up in meaningful and internet service started showing up in a meaningful uh, level in homes, suddenly there was a uh, it became an adjacent possible to have a device that would download media from the internet. Uh, so that was uh, the adjacent. That's what the kind of the adjacent possible speaks to. So what what it, what it, it, what we're looking at then we're looking for signals. Is it possible for an industry to change or a delivery model to change? We are looking at, first off, is, have there been improvements in other technologies? Uh, and in particular, has there been an improvement in the ability to measure, advances in the ability to measure things? So it took Robert Koch uh, develop, well, first it took, for example, uh, developing glass, Stephen Johnson writes, to then uh, develop the microscope to then discover that the water uh, was filled with bacteria, and then took Robert Koch being able to measure bacteria to figure out what were healthy and unhealthy levels. Uh, it took the development of the printing press to discover that there was a problem with nearsightedness. Uh, and so he, what happens is you'll have something happen that uh, you'll have better measurement of something. You can quantify the levels that something is unhealthy or dangerous, or you can discover something, or and then you can say, well, there's now there's a problem. So let's look then at uh, how that applies to data. This is a little, this is a little precursor to this. So what we're looking at now, just to quickly step back then, is have there been improvements in other technologies when it comes to energy, and uh, advances in the ability to measure things and and have we also discovered new problems, or, or has there been emergence of problems uh, that necessitate doing something differently from what we've been doing all along? So to do this first, let's look at electricity, and we're going to focus on a, a residential first. Uh, so this is a look at ERCOT uh, in Texas, which is the, you know, the independent system operator that serves most of Texas, not all actually. And what this shows is a March afternoon, uh, the breakdown, you see large commercial industrial is almost half of total load on a March afternoon. A March afternoon is the peak point of electric demand in a place, I mean, Mar is, the, is the lowest peak demand during the course of the year in Texas. So these are all super regional specific, uh, but in Texas, you know, weather's pretty nice, so not a lot of air conditioning load, not a lot of heating load. Uh, so you're basically boiling it down to industrial, commercial, and non-HVAC uses. In the summer that you see the load uh, goes up and it, and, it, and it jumps to where residential, which is about a quarter on a spring afternoon, is now over 50% on a summer afternoon. So let's break out what this happens then. It's in the spring, you have 31,000 megawatts, summer 68,000. So in other words, the increase in demand that must be served 
Uh, this is a pretty common scenario, either in the uh, winter peaks or summer peaks, depending where you are, uh, that you have an over doubling of the capacity to serve to serve a peak afternoon or peak morning versus the the lowest point in the year. So, in other words, we have whole tranches of capacity that exist in a. If you think of the electric grid, it's like a wedding cake, right? You have the first base layer of the wedding cake. It's your 24/7 electricity. This is usually supplied by nuke and coal. These plants are running all the time. Uh, and then you have the second tier of the wedding cake, and this is daylight electricity over most of the year. These plants don't come to life during the nighttime. They come to life uh, some point during the day, and they will generally run about half of, uh, half of their available hours and half their available capacity. And then you have the third layer of the wedding cake, and that's peak. And that's all of this infrastructure that exists just to serve a winter morning in Syracuse or a summer afternoon in Austin, All right? But otherwise, those plants are off, and they may run five to ten percent of the year. But so this is extreme, extremely expensive infrastructure to run, uh, and it's rarely used. So who is driving this third layer of the wedding cake? It's not commercial industrial. Their load's pretty flat year round. Small commercials a little bit. It's, the third layer of the wedding cake is being driven by residential. And it's, so in the case of Texas and other Sunbelt places, summer afternoons, we're building an entire tier of the electric grid almost exclusively to serve residential. And uh, so then here's, there's a cost element to it also. Wholesale prices in most areas of the U.S. will uh, uh, now operate on wholesale markets uh, and in the case of Texas, in the example of 2011, which was our kind of our hottest summer, uh, we hope forever, but uh, but probably not, unfortunately, right? And uh, it, uh, the average price for an extra megawatt hour of electricity on the wholesale market in ERCOT was $850 uh, per megawatt hour on average for the 4 p.m. to 4:15 block in Texas in summer 2011, August. Uh, the break-even price for retail electric utility was about $60. So in other words, utilities were having to buy electricity on average for $850 and then turn around and sell it for 60. That math does not work. Utilities in Texas would have been wildly more profitable if they could have sold less electricity. And in fact, most of the for-profit retail electric providers in the summer 2011 actually had terrible third quarters uh, because they were selling lots of le extra electricity and it was uh, very disadvantageous economically to sell lots of electricity for this reason. So now we look at, uh, from a data perspective, let's kind of drill in. Okay, our problem's residential. Uh, and so let's understand residential. This is the gold standard. It's a smart meter, right? Okay, well, what's going on here? Well, you can kind of get a sense of it. But if you, but you have advances in data systems now. This is the data systems we're using that you all can access through data port and may already be. And this shows it's breaking out every minute uh, by circuit. And so you get a, a really a keen sense of what's happening at the household level down to the individual appliances. So let's drill down there. Okay, now we're getting a picture. Uh, okay, homes are driving uh, the grid uh, sizing, and now we see what's happening. Let's break it down a little bit further. So uh, electric space heating, uh, resistance heating, the devil of the electricity industry, of, of electric uh, for households. Uh, when the electric space heater is on, it is the largest load in a household, about five to 10 kW. Electric clothes dryers come in second, uh, but they don't run nearly as often. They're running about you know five to six kW peak, but they, they have kind of cycles and a very just people aren't drying their clothes all the time. Usually, some do actually really. Um, electric water heaters are third. Uh, it's the third biggest instantaneous load uh, where it's present. And so what you see is they'll but they'll have a kind of a spiky uh, model. Uh, one of the challenges on a demand response model. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, trying to do winter peak management is that the people that would get creamed in, on winter peak morning management are all electric homes. Uh, these tend to be apartments, uh, tend to be more uh, and also like uh, rural areas. And, uh, and, and then you're talking about taking away their heat and their hot water from a demand response perspective. So it's very problematic uh, when it comes to resistance heating. 
Uh, pool pump is the next up, uh, depending on the type of pool pump. If it's a single motor, uh, then it can be like 4 kW constant. This is what a pool pump, that's, that's what a pool pump adds to the electric load when it's running, right? We call that the big bad cousin of the electric car. Their, their, their electric profile is almost the same as an electric car's charging profile, but it's about 25% bigger and 25% longer. Uh, air conditioners next. It depends on the sizing of the systems. And then electric oven and electric cars. So that, that's kind of the range of the big users in a home. So if you're trying to if you're trying to move the needle on what's happening electrical uh, in a home from an electricity perspective, uh, these are the things to focus on. Everything else is at the asterisk level, but let's break it down a little bit more. So there are four wet categories of electric use in a home. Uh, the first is what we call always on, and, and we hear this about like vampire loads and things like this as well. So this is a 15 minute interval for a home on a summer day, and uh, what you see, the green portion is the portion of electric use that is always on in that home. So what makes it up? I mean, it's like clocks, it's uh, the refrigerator. So it's the refrigerator and then uh, a Wi-Fi uh, router and a cable box will be the three big contributors. So the interesting thing about a refrigerator, right, is when you look at this, right, I mean, the the portion that's always on is a negligible portion of uh, of the peak demand. We had a, a city in Colorado. We were talking to them once, and they said, uh, "Oh yeah, well, you know now now that we're getting these hundred degree days in August, we're we're going to start telling people uh, uh, during the afternoon to unplug their refrigerators." I'm like, why in the hell are you telling your people to unplug their refrigerators? You know, those refrigerators are running to like sixty. They're running at fifteen watts, hundred watts. 15 watts, 120 watts, 15, you know, and you're, and, and you're having 4,000 to 10,000 watts and you're telling them to spoil their food and you're going to have a lot of really angry customers and you won't get any benefit. Now, a refrigerator in a typical house is the second or third biggest use of electricity over the course of a year. But from a peak perspective, it's probably, you know, it's down there. So, but just understand this model, right? This said the light green is the refrigerator and the dark green is primarily cable box and Wi-Fi router uh, in a home. So your second category, thermal. Thermal is what you get into with green building. It's what you get into uh, with trying to impact that. That's what green building is about, is around impacting the thermal characteristic of a home. And good reason why, right? Look at this. We are supersizing the electric grid to serve residential, and we are supersizing the grid, in fact, to serve residential thermal. That, that's what we're talking about, right? And uh, that's, it makes up the big portion of the electricity and it's, uh, and it's typically composed of, in the case of the air conditioner, the condenser and, uh, and the uh, air handler slash furnace. And they come on unsurprisingly general in most homes at the same time. So the third one category is electric gas substitute. There are a small number of appliances that you can get an electric version or a gas version. Clothes dryer, oven, water heater, heater. Uh, I think that's it. There might, there might be one more, but that's basically it. And so what you see with, a, with this home, this home has a uh, gas clothes dryer. And so when the gas clothes dryer is running, you're having the tumbler, so you're using a little bit of electricity. It turns out about as much as a light bulb. And uh, that's the contribution of a gas clothes dryer's electric use to the whole home. But if, uh, if you added an electric clothes dryer on there, you suddenly double the home's total electric use uh, when, it's, when the heating element is on. And uh, so that, and then in terms of a cost perspective, you know, what is a load of laundry? <laughs> we get into this metaphysical discussion trying to compare two loads of laundry to say what is the cost of doing gas clothes dryer versus electric. And so it's, it's difficult, but in general, it's like three to six times more expensive using e uh, Energy Information Administration average national retail electric and gas uh, rates. Uh, it's about three to six times more expensive to run an electric clothes dryer versus a gas clothes dryer. Uh, the fourth category, this is what we think about with intentional human behavior. These are the things that people control. First off, what you see is there's kind of two clusters of activities that happen morning and afternoon. 
people, now this is one model as when people work out of the home during the day and they have a programmable thermostat. The second model is they don't work from, they do work from home during the day. Sorry, this is the model when people work away from the home. When people work at home, you'll see more activity, of course, during the day. Or if they don't have a programmable thermostat, you'll see more HVAC use uh, on a summer or winter day. But let's break this out now, let's scale it up. And this shows you all the different things happening in these two clusters in the morning and the afternoon, right? And so first off, you know, it's kind of a small portion of overall use, but the other complication is there's a lot of different things happening, right? So you're saying let's, uh, let's take intentional stuff and let's get you to change it and look at all the things that people have to do, right? And none of them are very much. So that's a huge challenge, whereas HVAC, it's, you know, we're kind of drilling down, it's HVAC, right? Um, now, let's look at a one home, all circuits over the course of a year. So you can kind of actually pick up the vacation times from the dips when you look at this a little closer. But then you add on HVAC. So this will look different in Syracuse than it does in Austin, but it'll... Uh, but the fundamentals will be the same. This part will look pretty much the same within a general set of parameters that uh, uh, anywhere you go in North America. But then this is the seasonal variation. So in the case of Texas, about half of annual electric use is from HVAC, but there's about six months a year where there's no HVAC use to speak of. So it's all super concentrated in the other six months. So now let's look at a newly discovered problem. I, I say newly in the sense that uh, you know, the Earth is five billion years old, and we've discovered that our uh, levels of carbon we're contributing to the atmosphere are altering the climate, and we've, uh, some of us are on an ongoing path to discover this, but, but uh, it's a new problem, right? And, then, and one of the really new elements of the problem is discovering that we're getting worse storms. Uh, and, you know, folks up here know from what happened in 2012 with Hurricane Sandy, it's not just limited to the Caribbean or Florida or Texas, Louisiana. And so the question is, okay, what, is there an adjacent possible? Is there an adjacent possible about what happened with telecom and what happened with newspapers, what, happened, what is happening with cable TV? Is there an adjacent possible in the area of electricity? So let's look at disaster discovery and first say, okay, what do we need to accomplish before we know whether there's an adjacent possible? So we know there's a problem, worse storms, worse flooding, infrastructure being annihilated, particularly electric infrastructure. They're saying Puerto Rico's, what, five to 10 years if they rebuild in the conventional model of their electric grid. So uh, we talk about smart grid, right? Smart grid is all about discovering outages, okay? When, do you think Puerto Rico needed help discovering outages, you know, or Southwest Florida or Houston? You know, no, I mean, it's important, right? But it doesn't solve the problem. It allows for a faster diagnosis, but in many cases, the catastrophic ones, the diagnosis are painfully obvious. But the, the big part is not just telling you what's wrong, but telling you I'm gonna fix it. So restoring power. The problem, right, with, this, with a centralized, we, we talk about the paradigm, right? The Chicago paradigm of centralized, capital-intensive, extensive infrastructure. Uh, and in the case of electricity, it has to be voltage regulated and load balanced, right? It's super complex stuff. It's a laborious process to bring it back online when it's been wiped out. Uh, there is a lot of resident discomfort. There's food spoilage if the, if the refrigerators aren't uh, working, which you know, if, you're, if your AC, if your power's out for two to four weeks, your food's gonna spoil, right? Uh, and then there's communications are disrupted, which is actually an increasingly important element, right, uh, for people around the world, is uh, their mobile devices, their connection with family and loved ones, and ability to call for help, et cetera. So what we're looking at is, okay, what are we trying to do? We've got a problem, more storms, more damage, uh, we, that's on top of a second problem, which is we're sizing the existing electric grid to serve summer afternoons and winter mornings. And, uh, and so we have these two problems. And so then on the case of climate change and natural disasters, we have these rain intensive storms that usually occurred in warmer periods. It can sever the transmission lines, connection to power plants, and they're associated with the air conditioning need. And then you have the winter storms 
snow intensive storms. They actually have the same issues they usually, but they occur in colder periods, but they also sever transmission lines, connections to power plants. They don't tend to be as catastrophic on electric infrastructure because you don't have the issue of the standing water like what happened with Sandy, where suddenly, you know, big chunks of, of uh, Manhattan Island, uh, of Staten Island, and of New Jersey, and upstate, ports of upstate New York were suddenly flooded, not just with water, but salt water. You know, water, and particularly salt water, is super bad for electric infrastructure and the category of master of the obvious, right? You know, uh, but they're essentially the heating needs in the case of, uh, of snow intensive storms. And so uh, the question is could you use distributed generation for power restoration? Your metrics are can, it cannot be grid tied, right? In other words, uh, things that would solve the problem for Puerto Rico or would solve the post hurricane Sandy problem is they can't be grid tied because the grid is gone. Right? So you can't rely on the grid to get them back on. So you have to develop a solution that doesn't require a connection to the grid. Uh, it has to be portable and self-contained. In the case of Puerto Rico, one of the challenges they're facing is they can't even get fuel to run diesel generators. So you have to have ideally a system that could run on fuel, but also could run on, say, solar panels, right? And so it has to be quick to install. Gas generators and diesel generators are great on being quick to install. Solar panels are okay, but not great. Uh, and then you have to be able to, if you're going to have something that doesn't supply the entirety of a particular dwelling or business, uh, then you have to be able to prioritize dynamically based on the amount of power that's available. So you have to have some intelligence and controls. So the engineers in the room, this is a great engineering kind of a challenge, right? So then uh, the options are gas generators and diesel generators, solar PV, batteries, and energy switching routers. So this gets into the adjacent possible realm where we're looking at now is uh, you know, what is available that could, uh, that could make this possible. And you see some improvements, some big improvements in technologies, but there's some things that particularly in the category of these energy switching routers and at the making things quick to install for ba batteries and uh, solar PV, they're not there yet. And then, so this is a controls challenge. Uh, it's a, uh, and it, it, so there's a lot of big engineering challenges. There's a lot of big urban design questions around this. And so I'll hold off on the solar PV and I'll, I'll just wrap up with a story um, that in 1973, a Motorola engineer named Martin Cooper, uh, he uh, developed the first working cellular phone. And he walked out onto the streets of Manhattan and, and he had a uh, kind of a uh, Alexander Graham Bell moment, uh, but instead of calling to his colleague in the next room, he called his competitor at AT&T and said, I beat you. <laughs> right. and he developed the first working cell phone and he knew they were working on it at Ma Bell and he said, I got you, right? And that afternoon in 1973, Motorola issued a press release and they said, we have developed the world's first cellular phone. You'll be able to make a phone call from anywhere. Uh, and we predict that there will be the first cellular phone network in the United States by 1976. Tick tock, tick tock. The first cellular phone network in the United States uh, started in 1983. Uh, in 19, uh, in when, when it was started, it was positioned as a way to, uh, for rich businessmen to have a phone with them at all times to make important executive kinds of calls to other important kinds of executives, right? And, uh, and it, was a, it was a luxury device targeted to elites. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, so in 1981, AT&T, uh, still stinging from the phone call from Martin Cooper in 1973, they commissioned McKinsey to do a study and they said, okay, it hasn't happened yet, but we see some activity around cellular phones, and we want, McKenzie, you to tell us whether cell, the cell phone business is something that we should be getting into. McKenzie came back later in, uh, in 81 and said, we predict, we've looked at this, and we predict that by the year 2000 that globally there will be one million people using cell phones, right? <laughs> AT&T was like, that's interesting. It's not that interesting. So they took a pass in entering the cellular phone business. In the year 2000, uh, there were a million cell phones purchased every two days. Uh, by five, within five years, there were a million cell phones purchased globally every 12 hours. 
So things don't change until they do. And so the question is, uh, under for all of you is, think of all the things that had to be understood before a million people every six hours could be buying a phone, before 5% of Zambia's gross domestic product would be from people operating off of mobile phones. Rich businessmen? No, this was everybody, right? And so the world can change. The world can change. Uh, you just have to understand the preconditions. You have to run a lot of data. It's a big engineering challenge in the case of electricity and in transit. It's a big, it's a big uh, data and urban design challenge. I'm excited you guys are looking into it and looking forward to working with you. Thanks. Time for some questions. You, where'd the mic go? <laughs> Chatna wants a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Syracuse COE recently, or I guess two or three years ago now, we um, participated with the Department of Energy in a Buildings of the Future event. Um, where we're kind of talking about some of these, what are the sea change type things, you know, this, the cell phone is the perfect example. It changed, you know, how we live. Um, but we really struggle to figure out what could be that kind of change for buildings. Um, we talked a lot about flexibility, how we're going to do live work more, how buildings need to be flexible and adaptable. Um, do you see anything in particular, you know, kind of uh, separated from just electricity, but as a whole, what do we find in our in our buildings and um, uh, the built infrastructure, built environment? Yeah, so the, uh, first off, commercial buildings are a, a, there are fewer kind of common lessons for commercial versus residential because the commercial building can be used for just so many things. I mean, a 5,000 square foot retail space could be a card shop, it could be a dry cleaner, it could be a coffee shop. I mean, it, you know, so the range, uh, the range is pretty vast. Uh, and as a result, the things that will be driving resource use in a commercial building can be wildly different, right? I and mean, we've looked at uh, commercial buildings where the l biggest load by far is lighting, which in a residential is just not not a big deal, right? And uh, so uh, I do think that the whole, since HVAC is such a critical element, uh, that the idea from a green building perspective of <clears throat> passively intelligent buildings uh, is very, very exciting frontier. Uh, because you're suddenly taking the work away from people. Like, the, you know, the most genius uh, green, uh, the most genius building technology may be attic insulation because people don't have to think about it. It just works, right? But think about that. What can you do that does require a lot of architectural brilliance, a lot of engineering acumen, uh, so that the occupants can live in it without working it, <clears throat> without having to be PhDs themselves? Hi, a question about the, um, the idea of distributed generation. And I'm just curious um, with regards to the research that you guys do and the collaborators that you're working with, like how do you see or what do you see is the best way to kind of test that out or test bed? Um, you know, we chatted earlier about you could kind of model these things out, you could do simulations to kind of test it out, but do you see any of the communities that you're already working with where you have the smart meter technologies and things like that and other technologies that are getting developed as a potential test bed for some of these concepts? Yeah, that's a great question, Beth. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the, when you get into the adjacent possible, when it comes to solar, solar is a much better position to have good data <clears throat> than a typical home because interesting, it's pretty common in homes with solar that they'll people will get solar for residential or commercial will actually get a system that measures <clears throat> individual circuits. So, and uh, 
it's just it's the classic example back in the old days if they say hey you buy a car why don't you buy rust protection or a new stereo better stereo right you're spending twenty thousand dollars on a car what's another five hundred dollars right for a better car stereo right? that it's a well-known sales principle but in the impact of that application of that well-known sales principle in solar is that you will find a very significant portion of homes that have rooftop solar panels that already have installed the data instrumentation to provide very high resolution data. So that's your, and it's internet connected almost always. So you actually have in place a lot of the seed corn to get better data, to, but the software layer is terrible. We haven't found anybody with good software. So there's a great opportunity there to test out. If you can, you can, you can get the data, the data is there, it's gettable, uh, and there are problems to solve that you're in a position to solve, uh, but it involves generally better data, more communication, uh, and, and things like that, but that, that's an area of opportunity. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.